Yes. Sí, sí. Just a tiny uh, addition to the agenda. Uh, there, there has been for some time this letter by the Polish uh, uh, people, uh, I mean, the, uh, this uh, sort of initiative uh, that we were sort of uh, asked to sign or not sign. Three of us uh, mentioned uh, Pavel and Sreczko and me and Fodini that we are willing to sign, but uh, the rest haven't responded. So uh, perhaps we should close this now because it's more than a month. Uh, Okay, I, I signed in the end as an individual member. Yes. And thanks, thank Is you there anybody me. opposing it? Let's exactly. do it like that. Does somebody oppose it? Otherwise, we can go ahead. No, I'm for it. Okay. That, All right, that, there we go. The DM as a movement signs. You're for that? Yeah, well, okay. yeah as a CC. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Seal of approval. Good. Um, all right, David, let's, uh, let's kick this off. Okay. And Judith came. And Judith is here too. Hi. All right. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, live streamed uh, CC meeting of DM25. Um, let's start immediately with the agenda, shall we? So, the first point of the agenda is an update uh, on the Progressive International that we're setting up. Um, Srečko, Renata, and David, please. Uh, so yeah, start. yeah, I will I will start with it. I mean, it is happening and it's really exciting. And I think that it's su super good news for the movement. Next week we are going to launch it, and it's very, very, very powerful. I think that it's a very eclectic mix, and full disclosure is imperfect. It doesn't have a magical formula. It doesn't have the perfect uh, math on balance of uh, of all the groups that we would like represented. It's imperfect, but it is the most exciting group of people, like the, the council that we are launching. And more, more important than, than the people represented there is that I think that all our members in DM will, be, will see themselves reflected there. Uh, you will have, uh, you have uh, activists 18 years old in Uganda, you have very academic people, you have former presidents, former ministers, and you have people working on the ground. So it's a, and lots of very powerful women. I, I think that even if we delete all the men out of the picture, it will be like super exciting and functional, but we want to be inclusive. So they are also included. And, and so uh, that's from us. I think that is a moment that we really, really, really um, waited for. And what I, will, I want to uh, make visible to the ZC and to the movement is how it's going to operate. I think that it would be like a virtual circle where the Progressive International uh, throws ideas to Europe and that those ideas are processed and activated because Europe plays a tremendously important uh, role in the world and vice versa. I think that we can push also good practice. For example, one uh, very quick example is all the technology sovereignty uh, part of it how Europe also can inspire the rest of the world, but in different terms, in terms that are non-colonial, in terms that are like uh, full of solidarity and not just this outdated idea of simply aid, you know? And I think that it makes me very, very happy to rethink these roles and to keep the action going. Uh, so that's not much is going to happen until the Icelandic summit, if it happens, or the Icelandic virtual summit, if it happens online. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my quick update and, and I let uh, the men continue. Yeah, we had to have some men in the coordination body of the PI. Uh, so David, Sesh, would you like to add something? Sure, maybe it's helpful if I just explain what is gonna happen on Monday and where we're going from there. So on Monday, we go live with our digital platform and we have a membership drive where we say, you know, we haven't just written a manifesto that we're asking you to sign on the dotted line. We're saying we're building the Progressive International, come build it with us, which has been our message from the beginning. Now, a few exciting updates. One is that we've confirmed the Guardian will write the launch exclusive. Yanis is getting interviewed by uh, this young economics reporter who's super excited. Today he spoke with Katrine and with John McDonnell, who both get great interviews. Tonight he'll speak with Noam Chomsky. And we'll have an, we'll be in the paper on Monday, in the Guardian paper on Monday, and we'll be you know in the front page uh, of the site. So we're really excited about this launch exclusive, as well as a statement from us that's going to be published through all of our wire partners. 
Many of you will have known from keeping up with the conversation we've been having about the structure of the actual activities that we've built this thing called the wire, which is a wire service for the world's progressive forces. That's now composed of 20 publications that are part of our coalition all around the world. Brazil Wire, Jadalia, Lausanne Collective, of course, you know, Critica Politicians, our friends, Internacional, our, some, our not so friends, whatever it may be. But all of these publications will go out on launch day with our statement. So we've kind of played for bringing those people in so that we will also have that amplifying voice in the media once we launch. Um, so those are some of the basic things that are going to happen on launch day. But with the site, we'll also go live with a few of, uh, basic activities. You know, we have this three pillar structure that we've been building. One of them, one of the pillars is a movement pillar, which is basically about getting activists and organizers together. So we have toolkits about building tenant power. We have toolkits about organizing for a Green New Deal. We have uh, a toolkit around Amazon organizing. I heard word yesterday that Yanis was promoting the idea of an Amazon strike. That's something that we would want to bring onto the platform as soon as possible so that we can show that, you know, DM is at that forefront of doing, of, of leading those actions. So this is kind of hinting towards the hand in glove relationship we would want to have. The second is the blueprint pillar, where we kind of make these working groups to think about issues like international debt, think about issues that we, we've covered in Europe, but how we internationalize our progressive agenda so that we're connecting with people who are doing similar work in other parts of the world. And then I mentioned the wire. So we have these three basic activities that we'll be doing kind of running uh, and, and working with the members who are coming on board. Stretch goal, I'll pass it to you now to talk about the, the actual st structure, the sort of interim but the actual structure of the organization or Renata. Just, just, just a very quick remark, yeah, which I think that is important uh, for Jordi. We have people in the council like Francesca Bria, and I think that the municipalities are going to play a role. We are waiting for confirmation of some progressive mayors as well. And that's going to be also exciting because it's, we, we need to think beyond the na national state. And that's happening as well. And it's very exciting to have like really powerful people in the municipal movements involved and we also parliamentarians working um, uh, on the economic commissions but also on the gender uh, ministries and on the environmental policy so it's real people doing work you know in power it's very 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 exciting yeah for me just just a quick point and then i will pass the word to to pavel as well who besides david and renata have done an amazing job and they are 20, 30, 50 more people outside of this group who have been working tirelessly for, for one year, even more on this. I think that's important to state, but I just one general remark. I think DM25 is uh, part of something huge, of something big. Uh, this has been boiling for years already. As you know, uh, in Vermont in 2018, when Yanis and Bernie Sanders, uh, uh, the Institute, Sanders Institute published this open letter, since then we've been working tirelessly on it. But let's not forget the last 20 years of social movements from the World Social Forum and so on, uh, who have been working on this as well. Uh, what we hope next week will happen is uh, a new energy, a new hope all across the world. Uh, so I'll stop here, maybe just for the CC, an update on the 15th of May, we are planning a big event with Yanis, the Prime Minister of uh, Iceland, uh, the former uh, president of, of Marshall Islands, and Renata. And we will have this kind of regular, uh, uh, regular public events uh, influenced by DMTV uh, uh, in the next months as well. Uh, I stop here. I know maybe there are questions, but I, leave, I pass the word to, to Pavel. Uh, Pavel has also been working hard. David, I can see you. Pavel, if you don't mind, I just want to say a word that I was hoping Sreshko would say about the, the org structure. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Yeah, you'll say it then. Go. So, so, you know, we will have this sort of council, this council of advisors, who is charged with a very specific task, uh, you know, helping to set the strategic direction of the initiative in the ways that they can. Some will have contacts in certain places, others, you know, work in health, some work in technology. They'll all have a different thing to bring to the table. But the goal of the summit will be for those people to think about, consider, and ultimately validate a governance proposal for how we're going to think about the long-term institutionalization of this PI. Now, under this advisory body called the council, there is the cabinet. And the cabinet is the executive body that is legally responsible for the Progressive International, as well as its development decisions, staffing decisions, planning decisions. Now, that cabinet is composed of five people. Three of them are on this call. One of them is Renata, another one is Reshko, a third is myself as a representative of the secretariat. Um, and then one is Hala Gunnarsdottir, who is our summit coordinator based in Iceland. And one is Andres Arauz, that many of you will know 
uh, who is a former minister of Ecuador and a dear friend uh, of DiEM25, who's been working a lot on things like de-dollarization and is, 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 is a, a real comrade. And this group will be responsible for doing a lot of the planning and the, kind of the basic functioning and upkeep, as well as intermediating between this council of advisors. Yanis is also, of course, on this council. And the secretariat, which is the administrative body, do, responsible for the day-to-day -day function. And that, the, 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 those are the coordinators who are responsible for the various pillar functions. And that body, uh, so I'm the general coordinator responsible for doing whatever, doing this and that, this and that. And then the coordinator of the secretariat who oversees the administrative functions is Pavel. So I'll turn it to you, Pavel, to say a bit about how that secretariat will work. Thank you. And Pavel, if you could also integrate in that any particular requests that you might have from the CC for what you need from our side and so on in these days. It's, it's an incredible, the timing is incredible for this launch. So we were very, I think all of us are very keen to help in any way we can. It's a fantastic opportunity. So please let us know and let's try and wrap up this point because we don't have that much time left for it. Perfect. So I'll be very quick. I don't have much to add other than to say that we've built this secretariat, which is an incredibly diverse group of people from all around the world. Um, they're split up among uh, the core functions of the Progressive International, as David already said. So the movement, the blueprint pillar, and the wire pillar. Then there are people who've been helping us with uh, communications, developing our communication strategy, running the social media accounts, the web development team, the graphic design team. Um, in addition to a team uh, of translators, which is now about 70 people strong who have been working tirelessly to make, to make sure that as much of our content as possible is available in all of the launch languages um, before launch. And as we launch, we're going to have an open call to volunteers, um, which will be available through the sign-up form. And so we'll bring, be bringing a lot more people on, on board in the, days, uh, in the days immediately after launch. And I'll think, about, uh, I'll think about concrete ways in which we can get uh, the rest of the CC involved once it becomes a little bit clearer what the needs are, because I think on launch, there'll be a lot of unknowns, unknowns that we have to uh, that we have to address just one more thing i think that it will be like quite soft over the summer and it will give us also time as a movement as the movement to think ways of engaging once uh, the the you know the european parliament is active again and i think that the super crucial and the, the super powerful role will be like to have this very very active exchange an action at the EU level, but not only at the parliamentarian level, but uh, you know, in Europe, as I said, in some topics is still balancing the things uh, for good. And we need to take full advantage of that and also for bad. And we need to activate our movement to be like ready to to together with the flag of uh, Europe and the flag of DiEM have the third flag of the Progressive International. And I think that that's that's uh, what will make our movement DM unique and stronger. Great, Renata. When we have it, um, I think we can really leverage what we've been building here in Brussels and start using it also towards that on behalf of DM, but also on behalf of the Progressive International, obviously. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to that. I see Yanis has his hand up. Um, any other points on this? No. Okay. So, Yanis, you've got. begin with, congratulations to all of you who have been working so hard uh, since we initially launched with Bernie Sanders the idea of the Progressive International. Um, others have taken over, uh, grassroots people, people that are completely unseen by most of our movement, and they deserve um, a major vote of thanks from all of us. Um, and also, you know, a great appreciation of the fact that they've been working um, in darkness, uh, that is without any um, recognition of what they're doing, who they are, uh, all the amount of work they're putting into it. Um, Sergio quite correctly said that um, we didn't start this, we reinitiated it. Uh, for two decades now, the uh, anti globalization movement has tried to be internationalist. Uh, they have been internationalists, they've, they've not been organized. Um, but they have been internationalists. But of course, the story goes far back. Uh, I want to pay tribute to uh, um, a group of revolutionaries who in January of 1848 commissioned two 29-year-old Germans to write the first manifesto of a progressive international. Um, 
Engels and Marx, of course. Uh, we are um, trying to stand on the shoulder of giants that have been abused by history and particularly by people who adopted them uh, because uh, the best minds do not deserve their, uh, their, their um, successors. <laughs> um, and finally, from the Dean perspective, uh, no movement is better placed to start the Progressive International than DiEM25. And that is because we have been transnational. We are trying to avoid the mistakes of the first international, the second international, the third international, the fourth international. This isn't the fifth one, I don't believe, but anyway. Um, the mistake of um, creating nation state based movements that then try to find some kind of modus vivendi at some uh, umbrella level. We are a transnational movement. We are not a federal movement and we are pointing the way towards the internationalization across the, the planet of this movement. So it's very exciting. Um, it's megalomaniac. We are just utterly mad to even begin the, to, to do this. We have no money. Uh, we're just a bunch of idiots scattered around the globe. Uh, but we are right in wishing to do that because you know the bankers and the fascists, as I like to say, are very good at internationalizing and exploiting every crisis that comes their way uh, for the benefits of the oligarchy. Um, and you know, it's about time progressives do this. So thank you for, on behalf of the whole movement and me and Mowgli, my dog, um, for everything you're doing. There's no higher honor than the Mowgli Medal of Honor. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Yanis, for that. It's, I'm, I'm not gonna water it down by any attempt <laughs> to, to, to add to that. Um, is there any other point on the Progressive International? Just a quick one, just a quick one. Yeah, no, no. Super feminist. I mean, you move, you will love it. You will love it. They're amazing women, amazing, powerful women. Uh, they're, uh, and, and it's not perfect in diversity, but we are getting there. We are getting there very quickly. Thank you. Right. Okay. Any specific action points uh, for the CC, like we said earlier? Well, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. To share to share. Make sure that all of the social media stuff is coordinated with the Vitas, so that the assets are shared. It's clear, kind of on launch day, what our plan is. So that's just a follow up conversation that we need to have. It's our victory. Remember, it's our victory as DM as well. So it's important to you know to cross pollinate and to make it like sound very powerful. Good. We have another big topic on our agenda here, which is the big picture for Europe. Um, so sort of where Europe stands right now in the midst of this uh, healthcare, but also upcoming financial crisis. Uh, we've been sort of touching on this topic with our Beyond the Balcony series of calls with our different organizers, uh, elected members, grassroots members from around Europe. It's been an incredible, it, it, for me, I, I've participated in quite a few of them, and I must say it's been incredibly energizing speaking with, with our people around Europe and to see all the energy and the ideas that still exist uh, within Diem and trying to channel those in, in a certain direction. Because Diem25 is, is, is a political movement offering radical common sense. And the thing with radical common sense, I think, is that it's not something that you can persuade people of. It's something that needs to be revealed as common sense. And to have that kind of revelation, you need the crisis. And we find, I think, ourselves in the midst of, of such a crisis. And it is of imperative importance. We were born out of a crisis, the financial crisis, the, fall, the aftermath with Greece and the renegotiation of 2015 and so on of the debt. And it's incredibly important, I think, that we as a movement harness this opportunity to present our radical agenda as what it truly is, which is common sense, the only way out for Europe. And I think that the current political circumstances allow for that. But in order to do that, we need a very concrete, specific plan of where we're going with this. So I think we should, uh, it, it's, it is on the agenda. We can give it 10, 15 minutes. I would also like the floor on this particular topic uh, later on. Um, who would like the floor? Who would like to make an? I see Yanis's hand up. Is there somebody else? Because Yanis has already spoken. Or shall we go to Yanis? Yanis, it is. Yanis, take it away. I'll stick to my three minutes. Uh, this is no time for lectures. Uh, but 
it's crucial that we use our CC meeting every Thursday night in order to uh, highlight what happened during the week that makes a difference across Europe and also to pinpoint the actions that are necessary for DiEM to be relevant. So you, have, you will have noticed that um, there was a major decision two days ago by the German Constitutional Court, effectively uh, challenging the legality of the European Central Bank's uh, latest toolbox uh, for um, refloating economies during this coronavirus period. Uh, most soft progressives came out, or actually progressives, and said, oh, these German judges, they're terrible. Um, I have a completely different view. I think they were completely right, and they have done us a major service. The reason is that our leaders have um, given up on um, a common debt instrument, on a genuine Green New Deal. Uh, they talk about the Green Deal, but they are not funding it. They're talking about one trillion, but if you look closely at the numbers, it's only 20 billion. <laughs> Instead of 1,000 billion, it's 20 billion. So it's a, it's a joke. Um, and the fallback position has always been, well, the ECB will refloat us. They will keep buying stuff here, there, and ev everywhere, uh, which is a cop-out. Um, it is um, not going to help. It's only all, all that it does, it zombifies our states and zombifies our corporations. And that liquidity that comes from the European Central Bank will never find its way to poor people, to innovative people, to the maintainers, to the carers, to the ones who actually build the roads, to the ones who actually do the stuff, you know, the green energy stuff that we need. Um, so my take is that the Constitutional Court of Germany, um, effectively what they said is, look those guys, uh, you're using the wrong instrument because you are refusing to use the right instruments. Uh, and you can't do that. Um, th this is surely not why the Constitutional Court made that decision, but I think we should not join the flock, which is, oh, these German judges, they don't know what they're doing. On the law, they were right. They're, you know, a progressive movement like ours should seize the day, seize that decision, and use it in order to highlight that which the political class is preventing from happening. Point number one. Point number two, and I finish, uh, I will repeat what I've been saying in our CC calls with various countries, France, Italy, Spain, Greece. To be relevant, we have to take collective action, to organize collective action. And I am proposing that every single DMR targets, targets, helps plan a joint day of inaction, join, uh, joint day of inaction. That is one day we decide when it was going to be. No European buys anything from Amazon. Because we need to target Amazon, and if you want me to explain, I can explain. But that's a pan-European and even a global one. We can involve the progressive international. Huh? Brazilians, don't buy anything from Amazon one day. It's not a great sacrifice not to buy anything one day. But for Amazon, that will start ringing alarm bells. One that. And then another one, those of us who are in Germany, in Greece, in Portugal, we find one company, one small cooperative, one outfit that needs our help and we create a pan-European campaign in favor of that company, that cooperative, that outfit, or against it if they're bastards. Um, th that's my concrete proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Yamis. I think we have uh, David up next and then uh, Luis. No, 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 David. Yeah, I was wondering, you are multitasking. I see you writing on the YouTube channel. So Luis. Yeah, just to follow up on Yanis's idea, uh, lobbying institutions, lobbying MEPs, lobbying all these people is definitely not the way to go. And this is a conversation we've been having inside at DM. And if you guys know and you missed it, go and look at it because Mehman, a colleague of ours in the CC, had a wonderful interview with uh, Chris Smalls, one uh, mid, uh, mid management employee from Amazon, who went out, uh, put skin in the game exposed the uh, dangers and bad practices Amazon is uh, doing in, in the US, exposing them to all sorts of risk because of COVID, lost his job for it, and it's calling precisely for what uh, Yanis is calling. But going back to the question, Yanis, are we saying let's go and target basically the puppet masters of the establishment and hit them with the hurt 
with the idea of going after their share value, uh, the, the, the don't buy hashtag idea of, you know, moving away from becoming their clients. Um, is that something that we should really target and create a blacklist of establishment multinational corporations that, you know, do all this? Because they are the paymasters. They are the puppet masters. Is, is, is not a, a, a reasonably easier or more effective target for us than just going to Brussels and try to lobby? Because we see all these initiatives going around and petitions and all that. But are we really, should we really move into that action, go after the corporate stakeholders? Thanks for that. Let's, let's collect some points. Um, could we maybe also have a woman speaker to break the, uh, the male stranglehold on this conversation? No? Do I continue the monopoly? <laughs> 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 no, I think that is great. The day of action and the day of inaction. And we, um, um, at least when the, the topic that concerns me on the technology side, it would be like very good moment, you know, to start like, uh, you know, uh, supporting tech companies, European tech companies that are doing the right thing. I will take a look at that because together with not um, buying things, it will be not using services as well, because uh, Amazon is much more than just the products. It runs a lot of the cloud services of uh, public and private entities. And it's important to remember that. They're like running the backbone that it goes beyond just uh, the, the shit they sell, the things they sell. Thanks, Renato. Now, the one thing with these kinds of actions, though, it's a bit like when you when a nation issues sanctions against another country and it ends up hurting the weakest. So also when one boycotts someone like Amazon in a neoliberal system that doesn't necessarily cut the bonus of uh, Bezos, it results in people losing their jobs when you lose revenue. So a, a narrative, but also you know, integrating that into this action and how we make peace with this fact um, when you attack these people, when essentially they hold their own workers um, as collateral. Um, yeah, another. I see your hand up again. Sorry, a uh, question to Simona, actually, because I know that the cooperative uh, also, it, it doesn't need to be only companies. I, I know that the cooperative movement is very active, for example, in Italy. And, and maybe maybe you, Simona, have uh, some ideas and Sisi on, on the cooperatives, because I think that the cooperative movement, it, it should be something that we support. Oh, the cooperative movement as such, uh, um, in my opinion, no. Uh, it is uh, become uh, uh, just like companies with uh, different um, le legal uh, status, but uh, uh, their behavior toward uh, employees uh, that are pretended supposed to be um, members, uh, but uh, are just treated like employees uh, with the even less rights than uh, ordinary workers uh, is, is really nasty. So uh, I can check which cooperatives uh, uh, don't follow this rule, but the cooperative movement uh, as such in Italy in this moment is uh, corrupted. Yuri? Oh, hang on, you're not, uh, you're still muted. You need to unmute yourself. Yes, sorry about there that. Uh, I'll, I'll I absolutely support that idea. Uh, and well, we have some cases in Spain, for example, that, uh, and I'm thinking about the, the, the actual situation, this moment of crisis, that there are some big companies that are taking profit of this situation and uh, using it as an excuse to uh, go ahead with some plans that they had long before and they're using it as an excuse for example of closing down uh, companies this is happening that with nissan the the automobile company in spain uh so i give a, a solidarity message from the our comrades in in nissan in spain that are in strike at this moment fighting for the closing of their uh, uh, factories that they knew there was going to happen they, uh, but now Nissan is taking profit of this situation and saying it is because of the of the coronavirus. 
which obviously is not. This is uh, to give an example. Uh, some other examples, and I, I think are also important, are the, the problems that some big companies, big corporations, uh, are doing to small uh, and medium-sized enterprises. What they do is use them as banks. So I, I think that we should take care about that. What they do is they don't pay them on terms, right? So uh, what they, in, in, in Spain, for example, the medium of the, of the big corporation, the, the, the payment period is more than 500 days. And for example, on that, they are taking profit on some administration like the Barcelona City Council that is paying at 30 days to the big companies of these big contracts. And they uh, uh, take more than 500 days to pay to these small companies for the services they're doing. So I think this is something that we also have to denounce. Uh, obviously, we have uh, also to push public administrations to take uh, uh, measures about that. Uh, there are some uh, uh, laws that can be approved to avoid that. There's the uh, um, public procurement that we can use that to uh, um, oblige them to pay them on time. So I think these are the both uh, the two type of companies that are taking profit of the situation against people, leaving them to an employment situation, or against big company, the uh, small companies, and self-employed people, and it goes in the same direction. They have to close down their their own companies, the small companies, just because big companies are not paying them. Thank you, Ivana. Hey, thank you. When you ask uh, what is the big picture for Europe uh, or what I would wish if I had one wish is uh, for DiEM to take a bold stand and uh, present itself like the only alternative to there is no alternative and uh, the movement that will plant the seed of post-corona, post-capitalist uh, world coming from the part of Europe, which is in the periphery or not even periphery, uh, non-EU country. And uh, with uh, what happened uh, when the COVID outbreak started, uh, for example, with the uh, labor market, so to say, with workers that are basically working on a black market in Germany, in Austria, uh, even in Greece, who were forced to come back to Serbia because they had no uh, health insurance in those countries where they were working. And yet they were faced with the rejection of their own people here because they were portrayed as uh, enemies, as the carriers of the virus who are now coming here to have the healthcare for free. Uh, it is true that we have the residues of uh, the free health care system and uh, the, the deadly consequences of uh, harsh austerity measures, which were the same uh, as in Greece, which resulted uh, thousands of doctors and medical workers going to Germany. Our government even has the agency to export our educated uh, doctors to Germany. Uh, so those are the problems that uh, we saw what are the consequences. Now we see that there is money for healthcare system all of a sudden. So it can be done if there is a political will. Uh, building on that, I would really love to see this initiative for European uh, healthcare system. And another thing which also disappeared during coronavirus is the art or the artists. I'm coming from the theater and uh, my heart is breaking when I think of empty theater venues. Uh, when I think of all of my colleagues, friends who have no income right now because they are freelancers and how our universal basic dividend would help them uh, bypass this period when they have no engagement, when they have no income. I have those, those uh, 
points or, or, or issues as um, two of the most close to my heart at this moment. And I think that we have very uh, explicit policies how to solve this. So the only thing we need to do is to organize, 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 and get out there and just do it. Thank you. Thank you, Vanna. I also know there is a, a movement in Greece that is picking up quite a bit of uh, speed on supporting art workers. This was a discussion in Parliament as well. Perhaps uh, Yanis can inform us a bit more about that. And maybe we can learn some things from that and see how we can project that to the rest of Europe and other places. Um, I was, I've was i been very impressed, actually, by the level of organization um, in Greece around this particular topic. Um, and sorry, Serge, I'll just jump in just to add something to what Ivana said, which is also very close to, to my heart, this idea that we need to harness this moment in order, in part, to go boldly into the future, recognize that the normal that we came from before this crisis was part of the problem, and returning to it was not a solution. But at the same time, something that Sisi said in yesterday's Beyond the Balcony call about recovering those elements that have been crushed from our past in terms of labor rights, in terms of basically the class war that has been waged uh, for the last 20, 30 years, there is an element definitely of going back and salvaging things that have become clearer now, in the sense that during the corona crisis, we're realizing just how many things were diseased in our societies, in our politics, in our economies, and so on. So it really is a moment of reflection and a moment from which we can depart uh, with a much clearer idea of what we need to do to build a different future. In order to do that though, and this is I think very important for a movement like Diem, the, our identity cannot be a exclusively European identity. It needs to be more radical than that. It needs to be grounded in things that actually mean something to people, to the people that we're talking to. This has been the failure of the European project since forever, time immemorial, since the Renaissance, when people started speaking of this concept of Europe as an identity. You know, it, it, it has been elitist, always. And I think the unique thing that DiEM25 can offer to this sort of historical narrative around Europe is to turn Europe into something that is relevant to everyday people, to citizens, to workers. You know, a Europe that means something to people. So, and I really like Yanis' ideas on that. I like what Ivana said about that. And I think that needs to be one of our guiding principles when we decide what kind of activities we engage in, but also in terms of how we present ourselves, the narrative that we use, not to fall for the trap of, 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 of presenting ourselves in European terms. Because, and this is the reality of the fact, Europe means very little to people on the ground and for a reason. So we need to first make it mean something before we start identifying ourselves with it. Uh, so I think that's incredibly important, something we need to keep in mind. Uh, sorry, Serge, for abusing my, uh, my moderation powers. Um, floor is yours. And then I think we need to start wrapping up this point um, and move on. Yeah, maybe, maybe don't, don't worry. I, it's always difficult to be the, the chair, the moderator, and have an opinion, <laughs> although the chair should have an opinion and, and speak. Nobody well. joins DM not to speak. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, uh, so just quickly from me, I mean, I can try to wrap it up uh, if you want, and then we move to, 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 to the other parts of the agenda, which are more technical, where we need to decide and vote and so on. Uh, but just a general remark, I really love what Yanis said, uh, uh, and Ivana, I mean, what you are, so to wrap up, I mean, obviously, DM25 in 2020 has to move towards uh, more municipalism, I mean, which was always part of DM, but to think about how you can construct an even micro local or local community or cooperative in face of what is coming and what is coming might be an age of pandemic uh, or other threats like climate crisis and so on. So municipalism, um, I think we should, uh, uh, again, thanks to Renata and some other people in DM25, I think we have a very strong technological pillar, but what we can see now just with Yanis's proposal is how technology is also shaping our lives and how DM25 needs to be much more resolute uh, when it comes to big company firms and so on. Uh, I was really happy that the DMTV 
uh, we had uh, uh, the organizer from Amazon. I think this is something what we need to continue at DMTV, but also in other spaces, you know, to connect more with frontline workers, with essential workers, with organizers, to see who are the organizers, how can they get in touch uh, with DM members, with DM organizers, and so on. I think in this year, DM25 needs to organize much more, uh, 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 organize in this sense, you know, concrete sense, and learn something from also other organizers. Uh, I also think something what is missing, so as someone from Croatia who is stuck in Vienna, uh, uh, I think Ivana's perspective is really important because what we could have seen is this deep divide between the periphery and the center of the European Union. Uh, 300,000 people from, uh, uh, from Serbia returned and they're mainly illegal workers from Germany and so on. Similar problem in Croatia, uh, where most of the people returned, being gastarbeiter. Uh, so besides this, I think, which is connected to labor, I think it's an important question also, the restrictions of movement, migration as well. And something what that wasn't mentioned here, and I, I shut up with this, uh, I think a major topic which we have to uh, uh, focus on, and I, I would encourage all our all our national collectives, DSCs, groups, and so on to focus on is global tourism. Uh, global tourism. I know here at the CC we didn't discuss it really. I happen to come from a country uh, whose twenty percent of the GDP is tourism. Jordi, I mean, you're in Spain. Luis, Canary Islands. Uh, David, Portugal. Johannes is in Portugal not to mention Sisi and Yanis in Greece, Simona in Italy. I mean, everyone is in a one way or the other connected to tourism. And I think DM25 really needs to connect it to post-capitalism, to the Green New Deal, uh, to the universal basic dividend. I think that's something what we should do on all levels, from the CC to the national collectives and DSCs. So please, let's talk about global tourism the next time and what we could do. I absolutely love that point, actually. <laughs> um, coming from the other Mamma Mia Island, <laughs> Sergio. Um, so, uh, right, I think that's it on that point. Um, there's a lot there, a lot of meat uh, that we can dig our teeth into, or fried aubergine for those of you that are vegetarian. Um, so let's let's take those points and come back to them in the next call. Um, we have a couple of procedural points on the agenda now. Um, the first one is a request we got from our uh, national collective in the United Kingdom uh, for delaying their election. Uh, Judith, uh, would you like to maybe introduce this point very briefly? Yeah, so basically because of uh, coronavirus, um, they have not, uh, they're not currently in a, um, prepared uh, to have uh, elections and uh, they requested uh, from the CEC uh, to delay this uh, until uh, September. Also, the Greek uh, MC elections uh, have already been uh, delayed because uh, they were supposed to coincide with their um, national assembly, where they're also resetting the rules for electoral wings and national collectives, um, and defining the, the space uh, for each of these uh, to do their work. So um, for that, uh, for the Greeks, we had a, a validating council decision to allow them to delay. And um, I assume that if we want to delay the UK and uh, Greece again, we should again ask uh, the validating council on that. But first uh, we should explore if we want to do it or not. Thank you, Judith. Um, does anyone have any points on this? I have, yeah, I don't see any hands right now. So, oh, unless, Yanis, is that your hand or is it left over from earlier? Just very quickly to say that um, uh, rules have to be applied flexibly. This is something the Eurozone is not good at, unless it suits the oligarchy. Um, there is no oligarchy in DiEM, so we need to be flexible in the application of rules. Um, this crisis is uh, debilitating. The reason, let me just say, that, why is it that we, we could have um, an electronic election, um, even a, uh, under quarantine here in Greece, but what we wanted to do was we wanted to use the Congress, the MERA TM Congress uh, in May, uh, that was going to take place on the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, in order to have a genuine discussion, a proper discussion about, you know, the realm of the, of the movement, DiEM, and the realm of the party, the electoral wing MERA. And we wanted to 
because up to now they've been conflated. Greece is a special case where Mera is much bigger than the movement. In other places, the movement is much bigger than the electoral wing. And we wanted to sit down and before we have an election, um, you know, to have this discussion. And there's no, not much point in having an election unless we have this discussion. So this is why we were asking for that. If, if our comrades in Britain are in the same uh, dire straits and they, they want to re recon reconfigure and reconsider, maybe after they, they start meeting uh, physically, um, I think we should be flexible. Right, I also agree with Yanis completely. I mean, if At the end of the day, if our comrades on the ground are telling us they're not in a position to have these elections, then you know that needs to be respected and it's understandable, especially given the circumstances. Also, what I would add is that given that we have currently an ongoing discussion on, on the implementation plan and on uh, votes that will also affect the layout of national collectives, it might be an idea sending to the Validating Council a proposal, not only postponing these two particular elections, but in general, temporarily postponing elections until, well, essentially until the end of this period of consultation, um, followed, which is followed by the summer. And during the summer, it's very difficult to have elections anyway. So perhaps for the duration of the summer and then restarting as of September. So that could be our, our, our that, that would be my recommendation that until September, we have a temporary postponement of all elections barring probably the coordinating collectives, or we could say also postponing the coordinating collectives to September, which is by a month. Uh, up to you, comrades, I don't know what you think. Um, who'd like the floor? Lewis. Yeah, I would just uh, recommend to make that extensive to electoral wings as well, because that also requires a lot of underground work. And then again, as you say, there is one of the uh, implementation plans that's coming from Prague, has to do with electoral wings. So we may as well try to pass over this coronavirus situation, get those uh, you know new uh, rules on the ground, and then reassess you know in a couple of months. I don't think it'll make a great difference. It will take stress away from our people, I think. Anyone else on this point? Simona? Um, about, about the electoral wings, uh, um, at least about Italy, uh, we have uh, uh, many elections, uh, regional elections, that were uh, postponed uh, because of uh, coronavirus and uh, shall be in the autumn. Uh, having uh, um, late uh, uh, postponing the electoral wing elections uh, uh, means uh, uh, to have an electoral wing elected just one month before the next uh, autumn elections. I don't know if uh, it's a good idea or not. Anybody else on this point? Question is, even if we allowed the election of the Italian wing, electoral wing, would it actually result in an electoral wing? Um, because there's a reason why we're postponing all of this. Uh, it, Lewis, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. As Yanni said, I don't think we should be black and white. We're just trying to be flexible. Of course, if there is something urgent, you know, and that we can see that we can organize ourselves properly to participate without being really held hostage to any election candle calendar, because that's not how we work. Um, you know, it was just basically, I, I think that the message is, if there is need for flexibility during these times, because, or people on the ground requested because of coronavirus, because there is a pending assembly where things are gonna be decided, or a critical implementation plan that might, you know, change things, we should, you know, allow for that to happen. Unless, of course, there's, you know, we should be able to make exceptions if they come, uh, but, uh, other, other than that, let's just try to do the things properly. It's what I su would suggest at all times, you know. Okay, as, as an attempt to wrap up this point, then could our recommendation to the Validating Council be to have a temporary postponement of all elections during the summer period until September with the possibility of exceptions based on recommendations made to the Coordinating Collective, which we then will have to take back to the Validating Council, obviously. Something like that. Yeah, all right. Uh, everybody okay? Rosanna, you haven't spoken much today. Do you have any? Yes, I haven't spoken much because um, I had like technical issues here. Uh, so I 
had switched off my camera, but now I should. Okay, good. <laughs> good to have you back. Um, right. All right. Very good. So uh, that's that for that point, uh, which brings us to the last point for the live stream part of the discussion, which is a decision that was left over from last uh, Zoom. Uh, that was a decision about going forward with the establishment of a PNC in Romania and also our response to a request for the formation of a PSC, uh, no, sorry, going ahead with the, with the creation of a PNC in Turkey and our pending response for a request for a PNC in Romania. We had a bit of a um, disagreement about uh, what to do last time. We had that discussion. I think uh, the best way thing to do in this Zoom, just to have this uh, decision done, is to have a vote on uh, on these two countries, whether we should go ahead with the formation of a PNC in Turkey and whether to go ahead with the formation of a PNC in Romania. This is something that usually is coordinated by us in, in the CC um, and then is proposed to the VC. Uh, is everyone okay with this, to simply have the vote about whether or not to go ahead? Right? Okay, um, good. Yeah. Yanni, yeah? I, f I have a, a, an urgent psychological need uh, to speak in favor of the PNC in Turkey. Um, because I, I was involved um, with comrades there. Um, Turkey is very close to my heart. Um, it's um, a major battleground for progressives. Um, our comrades in Turkey are facing I mean, you know, a serious backlash from all different forces of regression. And I think that, uh, by the way, for those who are not familiar with the nomenclature of uh, DiEM25, PNC means Provisional National Collective. So um, this is how we created most national collectives. Before there was an ele election, the CC appointed members to a provisional national collective, the purpose of which was to be provisional, to organize the movement sufficiently so that then they can, they can have um, an election. Uh, and for me, I have to tell you that um, having a collective in Turkey that speaks on behalf of DMers, not just Izmir DMers or Ankara DMers or Istanbul DMers, will be crucial because we need to coordinate. We have a major clash that is developing between um, nationalist forces on the side, on both sides of the Greek-Turkish border. It is for, for us. It's it's crucial that we you know we 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 move on with this. About Romania, I don't know. Thank you, Yanni. I couldn't agree more. I'm seriously, incredibly uh, impressed also by the capacity and the ability of our comrades in Turkey. They made an excellent um, impression. But, okay, since Yanis took the floor, is there somebody else that would like to take the floor for or against uh, one of these proposals? Or should we move ahead with the vote? Uh, Rosanna, yeah, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, I also stacked. Um, I also speak in favor of Romania. I visited uh, the DSCs there uh, half a year ago. They were very active. They had many um, local uh, um, local activities they did. They, they did uh, a lot of different projects and events. And uh, they, um, they are very active also on international levels. So I would also... Uh, really be happy if you vote for Romania because Romania is um, the Romanian DSCs are founded four years ago and it would be really nice to celebrate this four years anniversary with a founding of a PNC because it's time. Yanis and Renata, I see hands, oh my goodness, where have we started? Uh, can we go to Renata first, Yanis, because you Sorry. Yes, I think that it was a great exercise, and I think that that was part of the nice uh, experience with Turkey, was to organize something there in advance uh, before going ahead to uh, to the vote. I think that having uh, some connection and presence and something going on uh, can not only get us know better the people involved, but ignite the movement there, so ahead of the formation of the BNC. So that was that's just a suggestion I want to throw to the group, and and I know that now is difficult, but actually now it's difficult, but at the same time it's it's actually more practical to organize things together because we can join without flying to Romania. 
and it can be a good way test or like a, a, a experiment because in the in the Turkish case, it's really really good to have something going on there and to, to see the capacity to organize. And it can be very fun. It can be thematic or it can be like general on on the general pillars. Yeah, that's my suggestion. Thank you, Renat. And just a reminder to everyone that voting no on the formation of a PNC does not equal expulsion from DM. And how dare you even contact us and get out? It means that we will continue to work with the people that made this recommendation to help them form the kind of uh, basis that they need in order to to create a PNC. I heard a this gruntled grumble from Cece. Uh, I don't see her normally because she's on the next page on the Zoom. I think I probably skipped you, Cece. Is that right? Did you want to talk? Yeah, right. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, something procedural. Uh, surely the two votes uh, will be separate, okay? Because they are separate cases, I hope. And Simona and Yanis, and then we go to the vote. Um, I just, um, I feel I have not enough information about uh, Romania. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, before voting, we should uh, um, make clear the reasons why uh, we think uh, uh, a country is uh, uh, mature for a PNC or not. Um, as far as I know, uh, I have uh, different um, informations from uh, many sites about uh, Romania. And uh, I totally agree with uh, Renata's proposal to uh, have a, try to have an event and uh, see how uh, organized it is. Because uh, I just, in Prague, I meet I met just uh, two people from Romania. I have no, I have really no idea of how it's. Uh... So if we vote, uh, I shall abstain uh, because uh, I have no info enough. Thank you, Simona Janis. Uh, look, I, as I said before, I don't know what's happening in Romania today. Um, those I expected the feedback from those who do. What I do know, and that was what the reason why I'm speaking is because Rosanna mentioned that uh, some of the DACs in Romania are very old, they've been around for years. Uh, that I know, and I remember how highly problematic they were uh, a few years ago. Maybe they are fantastic now, I don't know, but I remember three years ago, two and a half years ago, we had huge problems with members in Romanian DCs that were involved with authoritarian governments and with corruption. And I was receiving personally um, you know, hundreds of emails, people, what are you doing being associated with these people who are part of a, you know, a dictatorial regime? So we need to tread carefully. I, maybe things have improved a lot since then. I, as I said, I don't have information, but as Eric said, if we are unsure, um, let's say you know, we will keep working with them and with you uh, with Turkey, I know because I went there uh, recently, and they are. If if all DMers were like the Turkish comrades, then this movement now would be in power in every country in Europe. Thanks, Yanis. I, I agree also that it's the it, it, we end up with the same conclusion that if we don't know enough about Romania, that on the one hand seems to suggest that probably we don't have the kind of organization there to create a national collective. Otherwise, we would know more of what is going on there. And at the same time, the fact that we don't know enough means that we should simply say no to the proposal for a PNC now and work with them to create the circumstances so that they can have one. Um, the response is not, no, you may never have a PNC. But so, so my recommendation is to have a vote on both of these countries now, because the result is positive regardless of, of what we decide to vote. I see Rosanna uh, unmuting herself, but I have a hand up from Simona. Um, maybe, Rosanna, you'd like the floor first because you haven't spoken much. Okay, thanks. Um, what I was just trying to say is, um, I mean, I visited both um, both DSCs, Istanbul and uh, Bucharest, and I also spoke to uh, people in Cluj and uh, to people who organized the Izmir DSC like half a year ago. I just 
uh, can say something about what I realized there is that when I went to Bucharest, I um, felt that it that they have really like the man and woman power. They um, they also wa actually wanted to be active uh, during the um, European elections, but uh, then they had problems with communicating with the CC because they got no answer, even though they organized it all very well, and uh, things like that. So if uh, if we as the CC um, don't answer them back on their uh, questions, then we shouldn't be uh, asking us why we don't know anything about them. When we stop this communication, it's uh, just not good for the movement. Okay, on that point, I think I'd give the floor to Ivana, who is actually in touch with that part of Europe in general. Um, so maybe Ivana, you can give us a bit of an update there. And then, uh, I'm sorry, comments, I can see your hands, but we really need to move on. So I would suggest we go to the vote afterwards. Yes, I would like to keep it very short because we had this discussion on our previous uh, Zoom and there's no point on uh, repeating everything. Uh, but as Yanni said, uh, there are uh, many problematic relationships uh, with um, DSCs in Romania and some specific members which are even on the list for PNC. So uh, I would really recommend taking some time with PNC in Romania, working some more with them towards the um, coherent list of DMRs and uh, setting up a proper PNC. As for the Turkish comrades, we have been working with them. They, we are in touch with them. We or, they organized a marvelous uh, series of events in December and I am very much in favor of uh, forming a PNC in Turkey, while I don't think it's the right time for Romania right now. So uh, I would also recommend postponing formation of the PNC in Romania. I can see a lot of stacks. So uh, comrades, do you have something to add that hasn't been said already? Because we have drawn the lines of this debate. Um, if you do, Maintain your hand and uh, you'll get the floor. Otherwise, we need to really wrap up. Yeah, Sreshko, go ahead. Yeah, I'll give my opinion on, on these concrete cases uh, once we vote, which is very soon. But I want to remind of your point, Eric, which you had before, uh, which is uh, given the undercapacity this group has, including the CC, but also the organization, uh, given that next week we are launching the Progressive International, where half of this CC will be very active, given that we have DMTV every day, given that we have the Green New Deal, uh, given that we have the Balcony project, which means every two or three day zones with the national collectives and so on, uh, my recommendation would be to abstain of forming new provisional collectives in the next months. Really, because I don't think that we really have the capacity. I mean, let's. So I'm blaming it on myself that I don't have time to communicate with everyone uh, who is sending me personally or the CC emails. Uh, but I also think that we have to be very honest towards ourselves in this group. Uh, we don't have the capacity to deal with so many uh, organizational issues at the same time. Uh, so at this moment, uh, in this specific context of the coronavirus crisis, uh, uh, in uh, the context of all the new projects we have, DMTV, Progressive International and so on, I think we should focus on the priorities at this moment. And the priority is the big picture where we started this uh, chat. Uh, and the priority is uh, uh, to move forwards uh, in a very smooth, successful way uh, when we are very sure about what are the next steps. So ideally, my personal opinion, uh, at the moment, in the next months, uh, we would go with uh, the smallest number possible of new provisional collectives or national collectives, uh, because the undercapacity we have. I'm being very honest with you. Okay, I see that uh, Judith still wants the floor. Um, Louis, okay, and I don't know about Simona, potentially Louis, but we really need to wrap up, comrades. Yeah, um, I just wanted to contribute from the IT perspective because um, I've uh, been sending out uh, newsletters, um, you know, that are submitted through the Contact Everyone form. Um, and uh, uh, I looked at uh, the messages from our Turkish uh, comrades. They have um, 
uh, written uh, to um, Viemers uh, in their country um, more, uh, more than 15 times in the past, uh, in, in this year already. Uh, so they're really um, already behaving uh, like a national collective, trying to involve uh, everyone who, who joined uh, Diem in their country. And uh, so far uh, in Romania, we have not seen any uh, outreach uh, effort, also not last year. So that's what the first thing that I think we should do with uh, in Romania is to help them uh, reach beyond the current circles uh, and really talk uh, to everyone in their country. Okay. Simona, Lewis, and that's a hard end to this conversation, comrades. And we go to the vote. Oh, no, Lewis. Okay, but Simona still wants the floor. Yes. Uh, just one thing. Um, when I say uh, we lack of, uh, we don't have enough information, I'm not saying uh, uh, so uh, let's stop them. I'm saying uh, let's gather more information. Uh, then I totally agree with Shechko. Uh, let's uh, do what we can uh, instead of what we wish. And uh, I suggest to have, a, uh, if we decide, a call with the Romanians, even if they are not uh, an NC, and and uh, talk of the information we need and help uh, them to reach out of their circles. So my suggestion is gather more information for. I think that's something we all agree with. So that's a good point on which to stop the conversation. So let's um, let's move ahead with uh, Turkey first. Is there anybody, let's do it like this. Is there anybody who is against uh, the formation, the finalization of the process for the formation of a provisional national collective in Turkey? If you're against, please raise your hand. Now, all right, that's unanimous. So we're unanimously in favor. Uh, Turkish commerce, if you're, if you're watching, congratulations. We'll be in touch soon. Um, uh, now for uh, Romania, uh, those um, uh, against uh, the formation of a provisional national collective uh, for Romania now, but instead, okay, no, let me rephrase it so that it's clear for the vote. Who is in favor of commencing a support process to help our Romanian comrades end up with a provisional national collective in the future, but not currently? So starting the support process that we've been discussing, who is in favor of that? I'm putting it positively, you see. Positive energy. I think that might be unanimous as well. Is there anybody who would like us to proceed with the formation of the provisional national collective for Romania now? All right. Ah, no, Rosanna. Okay. So it's one uh, against and uh, the rest in favor. All right. So we will be in touch with uh, the rest of you in Romania as well. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, everyone. I think that concludes the life. Ah, Renata, yes. Are you voting with latency or do you want the floor? No, no, no. no. Uh, it would be great to task if, if someone can take up the task uh, on uh, maybe Rosanna and Simona because yeah. uh, on continuing the conversation with the Romanians. And maybe we can move forward to have the, this event or something in the next two months or so. It would be nice. Sounds good. And I would also recommend Ivana, given that she already has quite a bit of information in that region. Um, so not to lose that information. Um, at least a handover, if you don't want to be involved with that. Um, OK, good. So please don't leave the call. We will now finish the call with some um, non-live stream topics. But uh, David, if you could then can all say goodbye to our uh, YouTube audience. Um, let me know when we may uh, recommence. Let's explain why we decided to have uh, some non live stream topics. Uh, we decided that when uh, uh, it's about people or uh, uh, it may become about people, uh, we shall not live, live stream this part of the meeting. That's uh, the, the reason why we we are stop live stream. It's it's not the only reason. I would say the reason is also that now we will have a lot of technical stuff, voting and so on. I mean, we, which is kind of boring. I would rather leave this Zoom now. But now starts the work of the coordinating collective, which uh, is the hard working, boring 
stuff. I would say that's also one of the reasons why why this will not be live streamed. Uh, but if you want to join, I leave, and anyone else can can join. 